to talk uh, something you started or recently. Uh, the Bellevue Police Department was one of the first in the country to sign something to ca called the 30 by 30 initiative. So tell me what that is and why that's so important to you. So the 30 by 30 initiative, the overarching goal is to get 30 percent of women into the academies nationwide by 2030. Um, since the mid-1980s, uh, we've been stagnant about 12 to 13 percent women in law enforcement for going on four decades. So no matter what effort has been put forward, there's really never been a coordinated effort for all of law enforcement to really focus on that. Okay. Um, yeah, since the mid-1970s, there have been a lot of studies in um, policing and as to um, why that, that's occurring, you know. Uh, there's also a lot of studies out there that show that a police force that's demographic matches that of the society, better serves mm. the society. So there are a lot of efforts that have been tried and failed to get women into law enforcement. Um, but, you know, honestly, I think there was an uptick in the mid-1980s in women coming to law enforcement. But for whatever reason, they, they have a higher, uh, or excuse me, they have a lower retention rate. Okay. So they get into law enforcement and they don't necessarily stay either. So this is a whole, uh, how do I want to say it? It's more of a holistic approach okay. to not only recruiting women into law enforcement, but how do we change the culture to retain women in law enforcement? Okay. You know, taking a look at um, everything from policy and procedure, how they might be disparate against women, um, and we don't even realize they're disparate against women. So um, things as simple as uh, sick leave uh, policy or... Um, um, like is the maternity leave, was so, that it? Yeah, that so that's exactly where I'm going. It, yeah. So with like light duty policy, you could only, in our department, you could only use um, light duty coming in and working plain clothes for about six months at which point you had to either get back in uniform or separate from the department. Well, if you had a problem pregnancy and you had to be on light duty for, say, six or seven months, you couldn't run the risk of having another pregnancy for two years because for two years you couldn't start that clock back over. So yeah. that's one of the policies we took a look at. And, you know, it's really about people who draft policy oftentimes look like me. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, 13% of women make up law enforcement, or excuse me, law enforcement made up of 13% women, but actually law enforcement administration is only about 6%. Oh, wow. So even once you get into law enforcement, the odds of you getting promoted are even less. So usually the policymakers are middle-aged white males. And we think how we think. It's not anything against those people writing policy, but unless you have a, a variety of different people with different backgrounds thinking through how it, the policy that you're writing might affect people, you truly can't include everybody. You know, it's, yeah. it's about inclusion and, and transparency and communication. And, um, you know, there are, I use that as an example, but there are a number of different policies that can be disparate and and have a negative effect on on family life or work environment and you don't even realize it. Yeah. You know, I often say, you know, we're ignorant of these things. Ignorant is not necessarily a bad word. It's just a lack of knowledge in a certain area. We're all ignorant in some way. So we have to embrace that ignorance and invite in the people into the room to help craft policy procedure in our day-to-day -day operations to make it as welcoming an environment as we can for everybody. Yeah. So Your department should be commended for, for signing on to this initiative. Yeah, so um, to further that, you know, the 30 by 30 initiative, it, it started as a brainchild of Marie McGough, mm -hmm. or excuse me, I'm going to back up. You're fine. It's, it started as a, a brainchild of Maureen McGough. Okay. Um, I did a stint with the National Institute of Justice through a LEAD Scholars program. It's Law Enforcement Advancing Data and Science. She was the person who created that program. Well, one of my cohorts, um, who happened to be a former police chief in Newark, New Jersey, Yvonne Roman, mm -hmm. joined that cohort of LEAD Scholars. And her passion was trying to figure out how to get women in law enforcement because their attrition rate in the academy in New Jersey at the time was between 60 and 80 percent. So 60 and 80 percent of the women who joined 
the academy in New Jersey would fail out. Oh. And she was trying to figure out why that yeah. was so that she, they can make corrections. But then through that effort, she started a women's leadership group a mentoring program where they got a hold of young women who wanted to get into law enforcement and helped coach and mentor them to be more successful. And they were extremely successful in that effort. Well, through her interaction, Yvonne's interaction with Maureen, they decided that they were going to try, try to take this nationwide and increase participation of women in law enforcement. So it goes all the way back to the National Institute of Justice. Well, Maureen, Maureen has since moved on to NYU in the policing project, and she took that project with her. So the 30 by 30 initiative is at NYU with Maureen, and I've tried to help her get as many organizations signed on as possible. I, don't know what their number is now. Mm -hmm. Last time I checked, they were above 70 organizations nationally. Oh, that's great. Everything from, everywhere from LAPD to Bellevue, Nebraska. Um, so there, it's, it's catching on. You know, there are a number of things that y you can do easily to make, you know, small things that you can do to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just curious. Um, what kind of progress are you making? Have you hired more women since sign, signing this initiative? We have. One of the first things that I did when I came to the Bellevue Police Department, I knew we were extremely low in our, our, in our personnel numbers. We were allocated 100 at the time, officers sworn, and we had 82. So we had to increase our numbers by 18%, but we also did a needs assessment for the department. Um, and through that, we identified the things we were doing, what we were doing right, but what we weren't doing that we should be doing, and what the resources we would need to get there. So through that needs assessment, we determined we should be at 111 officers, which is where we're headed. Okay. Uh, we'll be there by the end of 2022. But um, knowing that we had not only the 18 officers to replace that weren't there yet, we had to add another 11 on top of that. That's it. Herculean for a, an organization our size. So I determined one of the things we had to have was a recruiting officer. Okay. So Howard Banks, who happened to be a sergeant over our s school resource officer program, mm -hmm. I, I welcomed him in um, as our new recruiting coordinator. Um, and he's done an outstanding job of, of recruiting um, a diverse population of applicants to come. Um, and when I say that, you know, if you call and you ask about our organization, he's going to take time to truly recruit you like a college athlete. Wow. Uh, he's going to have you come in. He's going to show you around. He's going to tell you what we're about. He's going to tell you what our goal is and what our mission is and where we're headed as an organization. Um, but we've done a number of things. We have a YouTube channel for the department. Um, we've done a number of segments on our female officers or our officers of color. Uh, we've done a YouTube uh, live event where we had five or six officers, very diverse group of officers, who just talked about why they came to Bellevue Department, Police Department, and you know what it means to them to be a police officer, especially today with you know some of the attitudes of society towards policing, you know, and yeah. how some of those thoughts are are not true. You know, that's not who we are. So they got to tell their story unscripted. You know, what does it mean to you to be an officer today? Um, and why come to Bellevue? We had over 5,000 views of that um, wow. in like 10 days. Uh, so it was very successful. But um, through our efforts, I've seen dramatic growth in diversity of our applicant pool. Uh, as a matter of fact, our last hiring process, the academy that just graduated last Friday, um, the 19th, mm -hmm. It wasn't last Friday, two Fridays ago. Okay. But anyway, the, the yeah. Academy, the, the Sarpy Douglas Law Enforcement Academy that graduated November 19th, uh, we were happy to report that four of our five ap um, graduates from that were female. Um, yeah, one Hispanic male, four females in that group of five. So, and it's not because we were targeting them, we were showing everybody the pathway to come to the Bellevue Police Department. We're telling them we're welcoming everybody. We want our organization to reflect the people that we serve. We're showing that they can be successful there. And when people of color and women apply, they tend to actually separate themselves out in a positive way on the list. Mm -hmm. It's just unfortunate that we don't 
often take the time to show a successful pathway to our organizations. But we've selected the best applicants we could from that list, and they just happen to be 80% female. Wow. So, yeah. And, and women do, uh, a lot of people may not realize, but women do bring something very unique and very important to policing. Absolutely. Actually, women, uh, studies have shown that women get into fewer use of force situations. They have a better ability to communicate. Um, there are fewer lawsuits uh, originated due to actions of female officers. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it's policing in society today, majority of what we're called to are domestic situations where you have to have the ability to communicate. Yeah. And oftentimes women do a better job of communicating. So, you know, I'm glad you said that is true. No. <laughs> we're good at verbalizing our feelings yeah. and, and, and can relate to other feelings. Yeah that's, yeah, that's such a good point. Sure. So it sounds like you all are really on top of how to um, attract officers. I know so many departments are struggling with how to even get people in the process, but it sounds like you have something really good here. Yeah, well, you know, I, I give credit to the people who are actually doing the work. You know, we, we show the, the goal and we give them the resources to be successful and they're running with the ball. It's, they're doing a phenomenal job. But I will tell you, um, if, if you're not um, deliberate about your actions to recruit mm -hmm. and to be inclusive, then you're deliberately not being inclusive. So it's important to take the time and put forth the effort. If you truly want to change, then you have to take the steps to make that happen. So, you know, again, I, I believe we've been extremely successful. Actually, um, I'm gonna think back uh, to, we are 11. Don't, yeah, don't, don't use this later. No, we, <laughs> we are. <laughs> this is the part we're gonna use. We are 11 of our last 15 mm -hmm. hires were female. Wow. Yeah. So. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah. So again, um, great candidates coming forward. You know, women, there's a study that I looked at some time ago that talked about women called to serve. Women are called to serve their communities at a higher level than men. But yet you see these unusually low numbers in law enforcement where it is a service industry, right? But women generally steer themselves towards teaching and the healthcare industry, nursing, mm -hmm. primarily. Um, that's where they've steered themselves for decades. What we have to do is show them the pathway to serve as a police officer. And when they see that they can do that, they can be successful, um, you know, they can do the job as it is required. The old myth of the bar fight that you're running in and, and breaking up these yeah. huge crowds of people fighting, that's, is truly a myth you know the majority of the time we're called to any altercation like that the fight's over before you ever get right. there right so um you know you don't have to be six foot five 280 pounds in order to be a police officer you know again you have to have the ability to talk your way through situations mediate moderate those types of things so um, showing them the pathway that they can be successful and then when they get into the organization, creating an environment where they're welcomed and feel like they're a valued member of the department. So That's awesome. Yeah. So I want to turn to uh, Sarpy County and the growth. There are a lot of positive things happening in Sarpy County, including growth. How does this affect your department? Well, we're growing as a city. Bellevue is, uh, the, over the last 10 years, the census, we grew from 51,000 to 64,000. A lot of that's through annexation. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue to annex um, other areas in our SID region. Um, but we're also, there are a number of um, large scale building, um, uh, what do I want to say, um, housing projects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're growing at a very rapid rate. And so it affects the department simply because. You know, the more people we serve, the more officers we will likely need through time, you know. But the services we provide, like I told you when I got there, the first thing we did was a needs assessment. What are we doing? Do we have the resources to complete that? And where sh what should we be doing? Where, where are we headed? You know, what are the services that our population would expect us to, to do? And do we have the resources to do that? So, you know, as we grow, every year we do an annual report. We look at every division within the department. 
and determine if we're doing what should be done. And, you know, we'll continue to do that, that self-assessment, continued self-assessment. Because if you're not growing and you're not self-evaluating, then you're dying. Um, so we're, we'll constantly do that. But it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be in Bellevue. Um, as the city grows, uh, the resources grow for our, our citizens. Um, there's a lot of new, new building, um, commercial building. Um, it, it's just really exciting time, yeah. And there's a lot of very, very positive energy at the police department as well as we expand our resources and we, we're doing some things that a year and a half ago prior to my arrival, we didn't even think about being an option. Wow, so, like what? Uh, but we're, our um, special services unit mm -hmm. is, is expanding. Um, a lot of people would know that unit because they are in control of our, our motors unit, but also our community service um, uh, unit. They, they're the ones that put the projects on. Okay. Uh, we do over 30 projects with our community every year, everything from our shop with a cop to cops and bobbers to national night out, those types of things. Um, as our numbers dwindled, our focus had to be on patrol. You know, you have to take your calls for service. We have over 46,000 calls for service a year. So you have to focus on that. So as things got thin, we pulled from those, you know, the school resource officers got thin, the, the community service officers got thin. Um, so we're, we're pumping those back up. You know, it's truly, it's very important for us to have that connection with our community. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that we're there to serve them. Uh, they help us solve crime. If they don't trust us, they're not going to come forward with tips. They're not going to come forward with, you know, their problems. Uh, if they're not communicating with us, then how can we serve them appropriately? We're just guessing at that point if we're doing what sh we should be doing. So, you know, very, very important to keep that, that communication going. So. so you're glad to be have a bigger presence in the community. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. that's important. Well, I know that police officers have a very tough job. A very challenging job. I can't even begin to imagine what you all deal with. Talk to me about the stresses of this job and what your department is doing to help officers cope now. Very good. I, I love the question. Um, you know, when I arrived in Bellevue September 1st of last year, um, within two months of that, we had the Sonic uh, shooting incident. Um, I've, always been aware of mental health issues in law enforcement. It's, I read a lot of studies on, on that. And obviously, um, as they say, most people go through two or three ma major critical incidents in their life that are life altering. Whereas police officers, they interact with hundreds of those during their career. So you have acute incidents like the sonic shooting where you see death, you see an active shooter that is occurring that can have a major impact on an officer's mental health, but it's really the calls every day. We get called to um, death frequently. You know, it's those, the chronic ongoing building um, inside of, of all of those stressors. So we have to be cogniz cognizant of that, that chronic buildup. So there are a number of things that we've done just since my arrival um, in September. Um, we actually introduced uh, a therapy dog, Mo, um, just in the last few months. That's uh, been a great experience for a lot of our officers. Also. Uh, so Mo is a therapy dog in the fact that he's around officers all day, every day. Um, everybody he comes in contact with is, you can see their, their mood lightens. You know, it's a, a stress reliever just to be around an animal, especially an animal that's trained to um, welcome you, you know, to embrace the cuddles, if you will. I've seen adult officers get down on the ground and, and roll around uh, with Mo, which is, it's funny to see, you know, but it, it's great because you know that's working. But we also use Mo for uh, victims, uh, special victims, children, different things like that to make them feel at ease when they're around police officers. We use him for community service events, things like that. but. Uh, we also um, started a mentoring program uh, where if you are an officer new to the department prior to going to the academy, you're assigned a mentor. Uh, that mentor follows you through your entire first year with the department. So as you run into issues that you don't know how to handle, whether it be at the academy, in field training, 
anywhere along the way, you have that person that you can reach back to. Wow, uh, that's such a good idea. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been extremely uh, well received. Mm -hmm. A lot of the feedback we've received about, about that program, very, very positive. So, because uh, oftentimes you feel alienated, you're, you're the new person in, you don't want to show weakness as the new officer. So this gives them the opportunity behind closed doors to ask questions they might deem as silly. Um, you know, they, so they can kind of let down their guard with that mentor and feel a little bit safer. Um, we also uh, recently started a, a uh, why can't I, oh, peer support. Oh, we, yeah, okay. we, so we also recently started a peer support program. Mm -hmm. Um, we're still in the infancy stages of that, but that'll be another opportunity for officers who are trained to listen and provide positive feedback and resources to other officers, you know, especially during times of crisis, to go to those officers and I, it's pre-counseling. They would help determine if they, you know, that officer, you know, should go talk to someone else. But we've also brought on a counselor. Um, we provide a counselor free to our employees um, one day a week. There are so many slots. You don't have to tell anyone in supervision that you're seeking counseling. You simply reach out to that counselor by email. You set up an anonymous appointment with them. You can speak with the counselor, you know, a number of times over a uh, month, two months, and then she would then, you know, if, if you need longer term help, she has her own private practice that she can take you in as a client or she can refer you to another um, counselor that might be helpful to you. Um, we've also incorporated what we call our blue room, which is a- I've heard about this room. Yeah, so it's a room that is approximately 10 feet by 10 feet, uh -huh. about 100 square feet. Uh, we put two massage chairs in there. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a, some mood lighting where you can turn down the lights. Um, there are Bluetooth speakers so you can during your break on a shift, if you're just having that shift that's really running you down, you can go in there, let your supervisor know you're going to be in there for your break, take your vest off, sit back in the massage chair, and kind of let it go for 15, 20 minutes while you get a massage cycle in the chair. Um, that one was one that came with a little bit of skepticism. Is that going to be abused uh -huh. or things like that? Has it can, been? It has not. You know, that room's been up and running for probably nine months, somewhere around there. Um, it gets utilized for not only people that, as a stress reliever, but people who have, uh, the equipment we wear causes some lower back issues. So you get that extra time out of the gear and you get that massage. Um, but it has been seen by a lot of people in, in a very positive way. I use, um, a lot of people might think, well, they're, nobody's going to tell the chief that his idea or an idea is a bad idea, you know, but I get a lot of feedback through what I call pulse surveys. Mm -hmm. So I send out a one, two, three question survey that's anonymous through like Survey Monkey, mm -hmm. and I allow people the ability to tell me what, what we need, where we're headed, you know, what, give me feedback on it. But so I'll ask them things like that. Are, are we use, utilizing the Blue Room? What, you know, A, do we need it in the first place? And if we do, um, you know, put it in place, is it being utilized? Is it, is it helpful? And, you know, the overwhelming feedback from that is it's absolutely helpful. So we partnered with Nebraska Furniture Mart to get those uh, pieces of equipment at a, at a lower uh, Very cost. Nice. Yeah. And yeah, so they were a great partner for us on that. Sounds like you're doing a lot of good things in your first, not even two years there yet. Yeah, it's, it's been, it's been uh, a whirlwind. There are a lot of things going on. But I will tell you, very little of what we're doing is because of me. Um, it's really the ideas of the officers. Uh, when I got there, uh, like I say, we were 82, we got down to 82 officers. I met with every one of our officers for at least an hour um, just to get their feedback on, you know, what's going right, what's going wrong, what are the patterns, positive and negative. If it's positive, we need to take it and build on it. If it's negative, obviously we need to change something. So working on dozens of different things, but almost every one of those are things that were brought to me. And I've just been able to say, yeah, let's do it, you know, and empower the people with the ideas to get things done, so. But you've listened, which is good. Well, yeah, it's a sign of a good leader. Well, it, you know, any, 
any relationship or organization is going to thrive if there's open communication and transparency. You know, where, where any relationship is going to struggle when that communication dies. That's when the relationship starts to die. By the way, so. Mo, everybody went crazy when they saw a video yeah. of Mo. So cute. Yeah. So cute. So Mo, yeah, Mo's got his own Facebook page. Oh, and my gosh. Officer Mo. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's pretty much a hit, and which is exactly what we wanted, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's a lot of good, uh, you know, public, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? PR. Publicity. Yeah, it's uh, just good PR. Yeah, it's good, okay. it's good PR, you know, but it really is good for the mental health of the department, you know, uh, and, and some of our, our victims, so. Providing so many resources for your officers, um, and that's, that's obviously is that one of the most important things for you? It is. It absolutely is. You know, I often tell my officers that, you know, we're looking to make them the best they can be. Because if you're the best you're, you can be, the officer sitting next to you is the best they can be, and everyone is the best they can be. We're the best department we can be, right? So it starts with taking care of ourselves. Um, you, you know, you, you think of an officer taking care of the officer on their shift by backing them up on a call but really it comes down to you know being there physically but also you know emotionally and you know helping each other through the day-to-day -day as well it's, it's really kind of like a family yeah so yeah I love it I love your philosophy so um, you've been in law enforcement for about 30 years right uh, this a approaching is approaching yeah, 27 27 yep. okay yep. 27 to be exact 15 months as the police chief of Bellevue. Yes. What are you most proud of? You've just talked about a lot of things. What are you most proud about of as, as, your, as your 15 months there? That's a great question. One that I haven't uh, thought about a whole lot. There's so many positive things going on at the department. Um, yeah. The thing that I'm most proud of you know, when I got there, um, it's, I, I think, I would have to say um, unifying the department, pulling the department together. Um, the department has, is reinventing itself through, you, you talked about me listening. That's exactly what I did. I listened to them and we, we have attacked almost every issue that was identified. Not only did I listen to each officer, but I brought the, the entire uh, command staff, the supervisor, every sergeant, lieutenant, captain in the entire department, we brought them all into a room uh, for the first time in a decade. They'd been in the same room together, and we did a SWOT analysis, looked at our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we truly took a deep dive on on what we're doing and, and what we should be doing and how we get there. And um, we came up with a plan and we worked, you know, we've expanded the table of organization. Uh, we're doing things that we hadn't done before, uh, but we're truly all in. Everybody in the department to a person has bought into what we're doing, where we're going, how we're going to get there. Um, every person I, f I believe feels valued, so. And when every person feels valued in your department, how does that make a better police department? Well, uh, again, I'm simply there to manage a budget, get people in places to be successful. Um, when they feel valued, uh, if they don't feel valued, they're gonna stop communicating. Again, we're coming back to communication. When they stop communicating, I stop understanding what the issues are. Um, the line officer knows day to day what needs to be done, what resources they need, and you know what the problems are. If they stop communicating with me, I'm going to stop understanding what the problems are and how to make the organization the best it can be. So when they, they're feeling valued, they come forward with the issues. A lot of the issues are simple fixes. Um, we take the resource, we make the fix immediately and we move on. Um, 
we're truly the best we can be because they feel valued, because they're willing to talk about the issues, about what, you know, and it doesn't even have to be a negative. It's just, it might be something we're not doing that we hadn't thought about. Um, you know, there are a lot of those things that we're doing today that, um, you know, just hadn't been thought through. Again, it's people like, I want to give up control of the message, right? So one of the things we're doing is um, our social media oftentimes is put in control. People are afraid that a police department's going to put something out on social media that's going to be seen as really bad. Mm -hmm. So the top executives control that social media, the Twitter and the Facebook, and they put out very generic and cold messages. You know, it's they're safety messages, but I believe people need to see our our character, you know. They need to see that we have personality and we do care. So one of the things we're currently in the process of doing is empowering some of our young officers who can speak to the next generation through social media to tell their story. And we're going to give them the keys to social media. Oh my. And yeah. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. You know, um, go out and tell our story, you know, because um, I, I believe we have to give up the, the control of that message as chief executives, you know, over 80% of chief executives are just like me. We're middle-aged white males. I don't know how to speak to a 23-year-old person of color. I don't know how to speak to a, a 22-year-old female and get them to be compelled to come to work for me. I can't send that message. I can tell them what I think, but it doesn't resonate with that next generation, especially you know, that I didn't grow up around. They don't see themselves in me. So truly giving up that, that power is, is, I think, going to be transformational for us as well. But so coming back full circle to, you know, um, people feeling valued is the, truly the key to a successful organization. That's basically it. That's the sum of our whole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One last question. We've spent, I feel like the last year or two, a lot of effort has no, not even effort. A lot, the last year or two, a lot of people have talked about the bad eggs of the police department. Um, here at KMTV, we like to talk about the good. Mm -hmm. So tell me something good. You've talked about a lot of things about your department and your officers. Yeah. Tell you some something. Some of the projects. Yeah. Some of the projects you're proud of. Some of the. Um, well, yeah. I'm, I wish I would have. Uh, I'm going to call it shop with a cop. And I know that's not what we call it as an organization. I should have asked. But um, next Monday, we'll be out at Walmart, and we have uh, almost 100 kids that we're going to be uh, shopping with um, to buy Christmas presents. Uh, that, that comes from, through our Public Safety Foundation. Um, that's a great effort um, you know, that our officers are involved in. The fire department and, and the police department in Bellevue will, will be there, and they'll, they'll team up with the the kids and go shopping, you know, with money that was donated and um, raised through the chili cook-off that we just had a couple weeks ago. Um, that's a great thing that, that our officers are doing. Uh, I will tell you that officers really want to know that they make a difference. They, on a day-to-day -day basis, they truly care about the community that they serve. You know, they want to know they're making a difference. They want to have those positive, what I will call career moments you know they're looking for that opportunity to make an impact so um, you know, we try to empower our officers to take those opportunities whenever they can we try to create them um, you know they're like I said we do over 30 uh, different projects throughout the year you know we'll be out fishing with kids as soon as uh, the ice breaks next spring you know with our cops and bobbers event we try to advertise those as much as we can but really get our officers out in the community and and you know, be a, we live, we work, we play in the same community that we serve. You know, we want people to know that we're there. We are the same as they are. We we care as much as they do. You know, you talk about the bad egg. You know, the bad egg might be in St. Louis, but we're paying for it. Yeah. You know, we have to show our side. We have to show our human side and and who we really are on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, and I encourage our officers to open that up to our citizens, you know, and it's part of 
you know, recreating ourselves on social media, letting our officers tell their own story, you know, instead of encapsulating it in my version of that, you know, giving them the freedom to tell who they are and why they're there and what really makes them tick, so.